We are live with the Short-Term Rental Pros Podcast, and I'm here today with John Hodge, who's also known as the Bank Whisperer, as well as a construction, construction, I don't know, what would you call yourself? A builder or a banker or kind of, you, you wear yeah. all the different hats. I'll let you take it off. Sure. Yeah, so sure. I've been in construction. I'm, I mainly deal with rehab. I do some new construction, but I've been in the, I've been in the building scene since about 2009, primarily in the, not only short-term rental rehab space, but really in the multifamily rehab space, which is just kind of a different animal. Okay. So, so you have built, and I know like recently, so you've been doing this for years. You're from Memphis, Tennessee. How many, I mean, you have what, you own a hundred doors at this point. Yeah, we're over a hundred doors. Yeah. About 120 and some change. Everybody's always like, well, well, how do you not know how many doors you have? Well, it's like, well, some of them are, are a work in progress, right? So it's like, we may have eight of them that are halfway constructed. So what do you do with that? Is it zero? Is it four? Is it eight? So that's why we have a plus minus on that. A lot of people would round up to 10. (laughs) That's right. Listen, I try to be exact with everything. I'm an accounting major by, I guess, kind of degree, but I try to be exact with and precise with my words. Okay. So how did you get into construction? Then I want to parlay this into how you got into short-term rentals. John is a part of the short-term rental super team. spoke at the conference in Nashville, STR Wealth, great conference. So how did you, I know you're doing a lot of things, but I guess, how did you get into short-term rentals in particular? And then what are your plans and ambition like moving forward with the evolving space? Sure. So I started back in in 2009, getting into the construction industry and was really intrigued by it. Before that, I was in the restaurant catering business and it was, I was, I had just so many built-in ceilings. I was going to college at that time. So you have natural inability to really grow something, at least that's where my mindset was. And I wanted, one of the things that I noticed is that at that time, average ticket prices per customer were anywhere from 10 to $20 a head. And I said, man, these tickets here, they just don't generate enough money to have any kind of like upside for people that are in that business. I just couldn't see it. So I said, I've got to get to something, some kind of business that has much bigger ticket items. And that's when I kind of discovered and landed in construction. So I started working there and I, long story short, I got in at the right time with the right company and it exploded. I made a ton of money just getting kicked off and had at that time more cash than I knew what to do with. We couldn't spend it fast enough. And I subsequently started my own business during that time that would run alongside the construction aspect that would do a lot of other trades work that my, the owner that I worked for wasn't interested in. And so that's how my company, uh, it's called Contracting Solutions, got kicked off and going. We started doing well. We were viable in, in the construction space. And I started making a lot of money with that piece of it. It's a good, good, good thing to do. (laughs) It wasn't terrible after about year four or five, but it's like the first several years, you make a ton of money on paper, but you just never see the cash if you have a big growth rate. So Mm -hmm. I find- you're buying new equipment, you're you're taking on more overhead. Your cost of goods sold continues to kind of grow as your revenues do. So it's like, yeah, you're still paying taxes, but you don't ever see the cash. So I finally got with a mentor of mine who said, look, I want to show you you're doing great in construction, but let me show you how to build wealth. And took me kind of under his wing, introduced me to banks, introduced me to properties, introduced me to brokers, like laid every single thing out for me. And that's when I started the transition from being rich to becoming wealthy. And so that was a, it was a pivotal moment for me because of, I didn't know what I didn't know. And there was, at that time, there just wasn't as much free access to information that we have today and really started my real estate career in actually 2016. Oh, wow. So you were in construction for a while before you actually started owning the properties. Yeah. So you were essentially, you were working for clients. That's right. And then you became the client, so to speak. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And again, it was, you get rich on paper. And then after some time or some leveling off or even a decline in sales, that's when you start to actually receive the cash from it. And so it's where do you shed that cash to as your best tax advantage and whatnot. So that's why we started buying real estate. 
Okay, so in 2016, you started buying. Did you start with multifamily and then shift it? I've seen, I feel like a lot of folk start a multifamily and then they pivot to short term rentals or, yeah, what was your journey yeah. from an owner standpoint? So I purchased a single family home that was just a regular long term rental. Now, at this time, I had the I had the hurdle that I feel like every investor does, which is like, how do you get in the game, right? It, there was so many things there that I had. I just had mental blocks on how to do this. I had to beg a friend of mine that I grew up with of like, he had already done a few flips. And it's like, just let me on your deal. Like whatever I got to do, like, let me know how to do it. Everything was so intimidating to me. I didn't know how to do this, that, but I knew construction. So he said, look, come on board here. We'll walk this thing through. We'll go 50-50 on it. And, and we did that. And so we purchased that first one there for $72,000. I provided all the construction piece of it, about $28,000. I'm all in it for a hundred grand. And then we, he wanted to exit. He needed to go ahead and hop onto his next investment there. And it wasn't crazy successful on the resale at the time, but I didn't mind holding it for a long-term, long-term hold. This is what I wanted to do. And so rented it for several years, just sold it about about eight, eight or nine months ago for $330,000. So it wasn't a terrible investment so cash like flow all the way through 30 G's. And then you bought him out, what put in another 50 to buy him out or something. Yeah. So all yeah. in 80, exactly. yeah, all in 80 to come out 300. So you forex forex yeah. your investment yeah. in six years. And the great thing was at that time is that I had actually bought him out with cash out refi funds. Oh, okay. So, so you didn't even use back, your own cash to, to didn't buy even him use out. That. They actually had appraised high enough to where they actually, we had a hundred grand in it. They paid me 110, essentially out a hundred on a loan. And then I took home 10 in cash and that's, yeah, that's where we just kind of snowballed that. So it really was like a, a no brainer for me. And that's when things started to really unlock for me in my head. And you gave I gave you the confidence and swagger yeah. that, oh wait, I buy something, I value add it, refi it off to the races, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Yep. So later on that year, about six months later, I just said, Hey, I want to go like, I want to swing for the fences here. Ended up purchasing 72 units before the year end in long-term multifamily. So it's two, one, two different one deal complexes. or multiple deals. It was two different apartment complexes. Got it. Okay. So those were good, easy buys at the time. Again, that, that mentor that brought me in introduced me to the banks. I had mm -hmm. the construction knowledge already there value add at that time was like what banks wanted to do. So there was just different lending deals there. We ended up doing that one for 10% down and 90% of construction and acquisition was financed by the bank. This was not a second home loan. This was not a weird DSCR. This was just how, this was just a commercial loan. This was how they did business. And so, wow. uh, we're, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, bank? <laughs> where'd they go? We're far removed from that now. We get a some, somewhat of the same terms. They're a little bit more conservative with kind of how they position themselves. But was it was a how, local community bank to your area? Yeah, absolutely. Local banks, and, guys, local and, banks. And that is where we go here. into because the loans were based strictly on relationships. Yeah, they had to check the performa boxes. They had to like perform there. But like when that stuff would happen mediocrely, they had the relationship and that's what they got it pushed through. And they, they trust you. They trust you. They yep. like you. They know you. Yeah. The, the and they like seeing the keys. history. Yeah. They like seeing the history. The fact that I had rehabbed thousands of doors at that time is that, hey, look, this is the guy's bread and butter here. And they, the only difference is he's going to own it at this point. So. Yeah. I did my uh, first commercial loan with a local bank. It was actually, well, I started kind of, uh, I didn't have conventional means when I started. Like I, I did not have two years. I got my first credit card at 21. So yep. when I applied for a conventional loan at 23, they kind of laughed at me. Sure. And for, I didn't have, I had like maybe one year of tax returns of like crappy, one year crappy tax returns. Yeah. But the commercial route is, I don't want to say the wild west, but if you get someone who you can like, at the time I was managing Airbnb. So while I, maybe didn't own any, I could at least like show the numbers of one like comps sure, uh, and they could take me into account. And the fact that I was able to sell them on myself, my ambition yeah. and got financing from a commercial yeah. bank, which normally people max out. It's like weird. Like I went the opposite route that I feel like a lot of people do is like they max out their conventional. And yeah. then after they max out their conventional, then they start doing commercial 
because the DTI, that's an income constraints. Yep. Whereas I started commercial now, two or three years later, I have two years of like good tax returns. That's right. And now I'm going to, now I'm doing conventional. Yeah. And I totally recommend doing it that way. Any, anybody that, it's kind of like you say, there's a lot of things that people, I don't know whether they're taught this or whether they just think, well, this is what somebody told me to do. It's like, well, they didn't lay it all out for you, right? Everything, a lot of the things that people are taught in this industry, it's wrong. It is not the way that I would go about it. And so once the people that get in kind of like my inner circle there, once they hear me out on how I lay everything out from start to finish, they'll really say like, wow, that makes a lot more sense. And the way that you did it, that's the way to do it. That really is the way to do it. I'm actually getting now back into doing conventional financing there because of the ebb and flow of tax returns and kind of like where banks are. And so if you have a pulse on that, you're going to have a big leg up in the market. Yeah. Well, I think it's also definitely helps because I, at the time I didn't have anyone telling me what to do. It was really like, oh, I can't get a conventional loan. All right. I'm going to try this commercial thing. Yeah. Like I'm going to, all right, that door closed. I'm going to try another door. But in sure. hindsight, I mean, even the way I did things like with partnerships early on, like I think I could have been more aggressive. I could have like swing for the fences harder. I was yeah. kind of conservative in hindsight, like looking back at what I did, people would be like, dude, you were ballsy. But the way I look at it, I was like, I had a high conviction. And if I had like a mentor who would have been like, dude, yeah, your numbers are right here. Like, I'll give you a loan or something or like, let's right. get you a loan for your portion of the down payment. So you don't have to raise equity from all these different people. It would have been my, advantageous. So my son, he's my oldest is 22 years old and he's interested in real estate. He's in the Navy serving his country. And he has a lot of advantages as in the loan space. And he's asking me for kind of advice there on what to do. And I tell this to every young person. If anybody's watching today, listening today, here's what my advice is. Take absolutely as much risk as you can possibly stomach as early as you can. Because as you get older, you will not be able to take that same risk. When you add families into it, you will not be able to take that same risk. And so even, I mean, people all over the industry, they look at me and they're like, man, he is taking some like risk. He is taking some like, but it's all calculated, right? And it's yeah. not nearly as risky as what I was taking. And I've been successful through several different types of investments and it is going, to, it's waning down. Like I already feel it. Like I'm taking less risk. I'm saying, hey, I think I could have done this last year or two years ago, but I'm actually just going to be a little bit more conservative and that will continue throughout my life cycle there. And so when people are looking at partnerships, I really encourage them to try to get yoked with somebody who's kind of on that same path as you, who has that understanding. Too many people jump into these partnerships without thinking through the, what's the life expectancy here? Do we have the same goals, ambitions and everything? And as much as I pair, I only have a few partners in my life there. And as much as I pair the things that we're good and aligned with, I also got to make sure that person is opposite me in skill set. And so the things that they bring to the table or that they lack in rather that I excel at and vice versa. Well, first of all, thank you for your son's service. My, my brother's actually in the army and he's, he's VA loan the crap out of that program, which for those of you guys listening, a VA loan, essentially, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but government subsidized, 0% yep. down payment, good, relatively good interest rate for so, people. Some of the best. Our, yeah. Some of the best services. Yeah. And anybody and, service. And you can do, I think there's, I think you can, you have to refi if you're in, if you're at the same base. So like my brother's in Colorado Springs, he had, he refied out of it and then did another VA loan. So he did a rehab on the property, yep. increased its value did a cash out refi, used all that cash to like pay for the furniture for his new yep. house and then did another VA loan on a different property. But if you move, so that like the thing that a lot of people do who I feel like are really smart, like, like I've talked to people who they join the military, literally not, I mean, they wanted to serve their country, but also for the VA loan. And they've intentionally tried to move like several yeah. different times because every time you move, you get to do a new VA loan, if, unless I'm mistaken. No, that is correct. And they typically want to have, they want to have these loans basically active for about a year. So it is a little bit longer, but that's, that's really not a long time to get those things yeah. restarted. And so the, they have significant advantages over civilians. They just do. And people that are 
serving their country that are in the service there, I encourage them to all reach out to people in the real estate space because they have a lot more tools kind of in their bag than most everybody else out there. Do you have, I'm curious, because you can wipe off the DTI. So I know we've said DTI and I don't, John and I don't mean us to get to nerd out with, uh, with the banking lingo, but essentially from a conventional financing perspective, which a VA loan is technically conventional financing. It's just something you can only get access to if you're in the gut or if you're in the military, but sure. you're only allowed to get a certain degree of like monthly debt obligation, which is your mortgage. You're only allowed to have so much you owe a bank each month relative to your income. However, if you rent that property out, like John said, you have to, you can't do it within the first year. Uh, but if you, after that year, you change bases, you rent that property out, bang, you're good. But offsets that DTI. So that you have to rent it out, right? With the VA loan, they don't get rid of DTI requirements, do they? Yeah, no, you do need to be renting it out there after that whole period there. But it plays into some other kind of things that they look for. They want to see, did you have you managed any properties? And so when you show that, it's that, yeah, I've been managing changing this one, it is a rental there, then they count that towards essentially your qualifications to get additional loans through that. And the interesting thing about the military is that number one, I just want to go ahead and state that they are just, their sacrifice, not only to this country for who they are and what they do, but also the financial sacrifices that they have to make. They deserve every bit of this and then some, but they will actually, for most people, they're looking at your W-2s or they're looking at your income there. And then they start to like carve out percentages for folks in the military, even though they may sedate that they're only making $50,000, they may get the equivalent of somebody who's making seventy to $75,000 when they add back all the taxes that are not in there that, are, that come with other people's normal jobs. They add back in their living expenses that are reimbursed and all that kind of stuff there. So even though they may not be getting paid a lot in the monetary sense, there's a lot of add back that they get advantaged of. Got it. So for those of you guys listening, thinking about enrolling in the U.S. military, it's not just not just the opportunity to serve your country. It's also the That's opportunity right. to serve your real estate portfolio. Uh, <laughs> so, OK, so you were back on. So you were multifamily, got yep. two, two buildings up to 72 units. When did you make that transition and why did you make that transition or why did you add short term rentals to your portfolio? Sure. So uh, again, with this, uh, with this mentor thing. So I met some guys that were here local in Memphis and they had a couple, few Airbnbs and I wanted to sit down with them and look inside and see what their units look like. they seemed to be very successful. They had, one of them had probably seven, eight units at that time. The other one had as much as 30 within a commercial building. And I go in there and I look at their units and I see everything start to finish. And I was like, man, this is really crappy. Like, this is really terrible. And so I'm like, all right, well, I need to see the financial data. Let me take a look at this financial data. And I'm going through all this stuff here. And it's like, wow, you don't have to have like a great product back in 2016, 2017 to actually be really good at this business. And so I knew that I was like, man, I believe that there is going to be a marketplace for people that want to have pretty decent living conditions. If you can make it in the crappy spaces, you can definitely make it in the good or great spaces. So I did that, executed that cash out refi on that property, that first one that I bought. And I took all that cash and I did my risk of buying a downtown condo, three blocks to Beale Street, that uh, right there on Main Street that I purchased for $85,000. Yes, that, that was $85,000 fully furnished at the time. And I paid cash for that because I did not want to take the risk at that time. Again, my mind was just in a different place than it is today. And I said, hey, I'm going to give this thing a shot. Spent about $10,000 furnishing the place, getting the place ready and everything else. And immediately listed on Airbnb. That first year, so I'm $95,000 in it. That first year, I cranked out about $52,000 in gross income at that property. I couldn't believe it. It, it, was, it was wild. 
no pricing optimization, no, nothing other. I actually used to go down there and clean this myself. I wanted nothing to interfere with me having complete control over these assets when I first got started out. And so I'm running my construction company. I'm checking out at about lunch or so going down here, getting these things clean, getting these things ready, getting it perfectly staged. And I did that for about a year and a half and added to the portfolio a little bit and was able to pick up one at $90,000 all in and around that area. And these were all just condos that were down in the downtown Memphis area. For several years, we were waiting and watching for, hey, when is this going to like run out? And it seemed to have never run out at that time. And so we milked that cow for a very long time, really got strategic with buying them and kind of the rest was history. So you started your strategy initially, 2016, 2017, you saw, holy crap, these downtown Memphis condos, you can pick them up pretty cheap and they're making, I think, I mean, your rate. So a lot of times when we talk to people in the industry, the ratio that a lot of people have for what they consider just like pure napkin math, good investment yeah. in the short-term rental space is you want your purchase price to be less than like five or six, some people it's six, but less than like five times your revenue. So if you're buying a house for 500, you want to be making at least 100K a year. Yeah. Or if you're buying a house for 100, <laughs> you might want to be making $20,000 a year. In your okay. case, you were buying for 100 and making 50,000 a year, which is a 2x, 2x purchase yeah. price to revenue multiplier, which is, yeah. which is nuts, which is literally it's nuts. It's crazy. You can go back and listen to a podcast that, that Bill Faith put out. And he was episode 17, I believe, in his podcast there of STR. Unfiltered, I think. Unfiltered. And, and it may have been the one before that. It was, but it is one in there. And he's talking about this John Hodge guy from Memphis, Tennessee. I would go to these like short term rental communities and they'd be like, yeah, hey, where are you from? And it's like, yeah, I'm from Memphis. And they're like, oh, shoot. Or like, are you okay? I think, <laughs> how is everything? And I was like, I, yeah, I think everything's great, I guess. Yeah, we're doing okay. And I did not understand what everybody else was doing all over the country. And I didn't understand how much on a relative was. basis, yeah, how crazy what you were doing was. And so it wasn't until we started benchmarking in Bill's Mastermind that they're just like, man, do you think John's like really filling out this uh, information <laughs> stuff like correctly? Like, it's like, I, I, yeah, listen, numbers is my thing. Like double check them. Like here's my revenue number. I was like bringing these in saying, this is it. Right. And it was like 40, 45, 50, 55% cash on cash returns. People just couldn't believe it. And so we've been sitting here in this honey hole for, yes, it's 2016 now. And the units weren't as big as what people were purchasing at the time. Again, we couldn't contemplate that. We couldn't even think about spending seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars on a purchase there because we were buying these for so cheap. So yeah, we did that for several years. We still have That's these units. How many did you pick up? So I was able to pick up and I've got to date in just that little single block. Actually, there's 17 units. That and I are own. they doing, or were they doing 50K on average? And I guess so what was their average purchase price? Yes. Yeah, so 50K is actually on the lowest end. So that's like the starting, the one bedrooms are doing that. Two bedrooms are doing around 65 to 75,000. And then my three bedrooms were doing a hundred thousand so, dollars. And they, and then how has that changed over time? Like has, have people sure. found out that John Hodge is making all this money here? <laughs> like let's, well, we're all going to Tennessee today. Yeah. Un unfortunately, when people see you pull up in a Lamborghini, they think that they understand that something is going on money-wise there. So that's a challenge for me. Yeah, you so, got to leave the Lamborghini home when you're yeah, showing up to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just Show to kind of give- overalls in your truck. Yeah. Just to give a comparison there. So we're buying these, the one bedrooms between, call it $100,000. Those were forty-five dollars to $50,000 that those were generating. The two bedrooms were buying for 140 to around 180, and those were generating the 65 to 75. And then the three bedrooms I uh, purchased for 300,000 that were doing 100 grand there. Those were back from a span of 2016 all the way up to around 2019. And so the same $300,000 purchase today will transact for around four seventy five to five hundred thousand dollars still hits the metric but it doesn't hit the metric for me anymore 
And it's that's... like it hits that five X multiplier. But when you were doing two X multiplier, now you're like, ah, five X. Listen, for me. I'm going to like people are like, hey, they're bringing me these investments. They're like, man, would you consider over here? And it's like, I got to go take a loss to go buy a beach property, right? I got to go take a loss to go invest in any other place in the country. And people ask all the time. They're like, man, are you worried about people coming to Memphis and getting into your spots and all that kind of stuff there? Real estate has been the most freeing and liberating business that I've ever been in because what's good for me, I, the second best thing is what's good for everybody else around me. And the rising tide truly does rise all boats. So I am happy for people to do that. Now, the challenge with Memphis is that we are so pocketed and landlocked with HOAs downtown, with pockets of areas that are very challenging, I'll say, they are lacking in as much security as they may need. A lot of investors come in and they get annihilated here. They get sold on this property that looks this way and they don't understand the neighborhood. They see, dynamics. They see the pictures, they go under contract on it and they just yep. assume it's all going to be okay. Yeah. And so I don't mind because a lot of them I've known have come here. They've gotten burned. They've gotten out and you have to have boots on the ground. The management pieces here are they're really not management companies. They're actually just construction companies in disguise. So when you see it, it's like, oh, this thing went wrong. That thing went wrong. And you don't have a good grasp on that. It's a very challenging place to be in. So I say that 50% returns, they come with risk. They come with so risk. So you are the kingpin of Memphis, Tennessee. And if anybody is going to come into your area, <laughs> <laughs> prepare to be not annihilated, not by you, but by the city itself or the, the environment the around you yes yes absolutely that's a great way to put it okay so have you done so you've got 17 which you bought let's just say your average purchase price was like i don't know let's call it 150 do you think that's fair i think it probably about 175 yeah okay let's just even call it 200 just 200, still gonna sure. be, the yep. numbers are still gonna be crazy so all right, 17 times 200. We're at 3.4 million in like just purchase price value. I'm assuming you on average put what 20% down on these or maybe you had the commercial bank relationship so you could do lower. Yeah, so I put 20% down on the initial purchases, yes, on all of these. I ran that for a long time and actually did a portfolio cash out refi in 2021. Locked in rates at 5% across the board and did a full cash out refi on that. So, and what did this, they, what did the portfolio appraise for? Yeah. So the portfolio appraised for gosh, five of the units weren't in there, but I'll add that manually. So you're talking about the whole portfolio appraised for around five and a half million dollars. Dang. So, and I was rounding up before with 3.4 million, keep that in mind. But so we're saying two point over $2 million dollars of equity value when you just your initial cash investment, your down payment was like in the 600s or roughly. Yeah. I mean, you probably moved some under other cash out refis around. To yeah, exactly. So it's crazy complicated, even for explanation, but you could say, but safely, I had 800,000 in equity put out into this before I did executed my cash out refi. And so essentially boiling it all down is that my payment a month at that time was around $10,000 a month. So that's the nut, right? And that's principal interest and everything. I need to get in there. Crazy for 17 properties. But yeah. <laughs> that is so <laughs> not I executed my cash out refi. I retained about $830,000 that was paid out to me over and above my loan. And my payment went from 10000 and now it is at like 12300 So it's a $2,300 trade monthly in a note for around $830,000. To me, that's not a good deal. That's a great deal. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, even that interest, that's what's 800K at like a 0.002% interest rate might be $2,000 a month. Yeah. Or practically zero. I mean, zero. Yeah. Be, if you're rounding, it would be, you'd be rounding to zero. Sure. Okay. And then these properties, so your 12K is your interest. What is what and they are generating what is the let's just say 17 of them on average they generate how much per month yeah so right now we're averaging around seventy thousand dollars a month okay so 70 grand a month twelve thousand a mortgage let's say you're cleaning 
let's say your cleaning expense will probably roughly around 10 to 15 percent or Jeremy, my cleaning is like extremely low. This is another hot, you got full time cleaner. Yeah, it's a hot button topic in my in our mastermind group there. <laughs> so, so your expenses I, are low too. You're, all right. I'll say this: it's twenty five bucks a turn on average for me to uh, turn a unit because I employ somebody essentially full time, and it works out for them. It works out for us. It's a win. Yeah, they can clean them. They can clean them pretty quickly. I'm sure you have linens like around so they don't have to wait for the washer. Everything dryer. is built, everything is built around speed. Yes. Got uh, it. So you've got, you've got scale, thing, economies of scale. Yeah. And the number one thing that they get to do, and this is like super important to me for our cleanings, is they get to pick up and they get to drop their kids off at school every single day. I also we also just sent our one of our cleaners on a full paid for week's vacation at the beach because they are so essential for our business. So, wow. So you, you treat your people, right? You take a people first mentality. Yep. Okay. Bonus so, awesome. yep. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to reverse. Sorry. We got 70 K oh, yeah. of, yep. of revenue here. So I'm just going to call your cleaning percentage. I mean, what would even be a fair percentage? Like less than 5% of your revenue. Yes, it's called 5%. It's called 5%. Sure. All right. 5% of 70 K. All right. This is where my meant that's 3,500 a month, I believe in cleaning expense. So, I mean, you're at 65 K post cleaning utilities, probably what another, I mean, I don't know, five, $400 per unit or something. These Maybe. are really small. So like two, 200 would be like on the highest end. Yeah. We've, All right. We've another, th so that's another 3,500 away. So mm -hmm. Now we're, I mean, you're pretty much, I mean, dang, you're at like six, I mean, over $60,000 pre, pre mortgage payment. And then yeah. you, so you're cash flowing like 50 grand a month off these things. Yeah. So we, where we say, clap, guys, this is where we <laughs> clap. This is where <laughs> we, we all listen we, and get to give some snaps. <laughs> we, we like to, we like to run on a 40% model for our debt and our expense ratio there. So I take whatever my gross revenue is and I like by point four. Yep. And yeah. that's what I should be having. Now that's not just expenses, that's expenses and my debt service. Those same rules do not apply today for what we figure, but it is what we have historically done based on interest rates, based on the purchase prices that we had, and based on our economies of scale discounts. Got it. Okay. So things were crazy. You saw it, you smelt it, you went for it. You yeah. went for it. So, all right, but people talk, well, times were different. I bought a house four month, weeks ago, just listed it yesterday. Like I'm still making moves personally, but yeah, well, tell us about the today. Are, is your foot yes. still on the pedal? I guess, yeah, how have you went? Have you done anything in addition to those 17 units there? I know we're not at your 130 yet, so I know there's some in the middle that we haven't talked yeah. about. But <laughs> yeah, what, do you, what have you done? What else is there? What else is your portfolio yeah. looking like? How are you adding to it today? So I always have to go back to something that uh, Richard Fertig told me in this space and it struck a chord with me. What worked in the past will not work in the future. And so I always try to make sure that I have that mindset just kind of at the forefront of my mind whenever I'm making investment decisions. The other piece is that my only regrets in real estate, they pretty much the summary is I didn't buy enough fucking real estate. And so those are my biggest regrets. And so I don't want to repeat those same mistakes. So my gas pedal is pushed all the way to the floor at all times. My buying strategy is like, is very much different. I am waiting for items that are going to be sitting on market typically for about 30 days, maybe 40 days before I'm ever even considering them to, for a purchase. I, um, I, I, I want a hairier deal. I want something that has like complications with it. I want people that need to be moving from a time aspect very quickly. So I am buying much differently. I am typically going out there over the last six months, I have made five purchases and my discounts from their initial ask price has ranged anywhere from 12% all the way up to 33% off of their ask price. So when I go out there and I look at things that are on market there, I put on a whole new cap with that. And things like tools that I use for STR insights, they really help me kind of like gauge of where I need to be. And I am also kind of like strategically saying like, well, revenue wise, what is trending there? 
And then on the buy side, it won't be able to pick up how much you can discount your, their average price sold. So you have to make that determination in your head. If I've got a property that's been on the market for two weeks versus like two and a half months, those are different buying criteria there. I think that people are going to be a little bit more apt to make a great deal for me at the two and a half month mark. Yeah. And they probably know that you're serious. You're going in, you're going to do the deal. Cause I feel like at that point, if it's two and a half months, they may have already been under contract with somebody sure. who was a little bit less serious or saw the inspection came back and there was issues, or they may have had financing yeah. issues at that point. So now One it's like big- you're coming in, you come in when you can like save them. Like yeah. that's where you're coming in with your cape on and yep. you're ready to. <laughs> one, one of the biggest things that I send over whenever I've been making these recent purchases is a liquidity letter. And I will send this in with my offer and it will show in there that I've got a million dollars in cash ready to go. Now, am I going to, am I going to buy their property a million dollars in cash? No, no but, you're not gonna around. but they know that I have a certain level of ability to purchase that property there. They feel comfortable with that. Nobody's offering that to them. Nobody's like opening up the curtains there. I'm all ears for what questions they may have for me. So I go through this kind of this rhythm and this dance of this is how well qualified I am. And I am your best hope right now. And then, okay, so that's how you're getting deals. What types of your, are you doing downtown Memphis, Tennessee? You don't have to say exactly where, but like what types of properties are you looking for now? Yeah. What's your I buy am, box, so to speak? Sure. So I am actually diversifying outside of Memphis. So I have kind of fit, hit the fill on my bucket here for what I'm going to be doing real estate wise. If something happens to like be handed to me falling in my lap, I have to take a deal. I, I might, but I am buying in Hot Springs, Arkansas right now. I am buying in Panama City Beach right now. And are you, so, and you, I think you touched on this earlier. Are you looking for more new build opportunities and using your construction expertise? The answer is yes and no. Or rehab. So rehab yes. opportunities. So I am going back to my traditions of real estate, which are forcing the appreciation piece versus I got a great property and I can just add a hot tub here. Like I, I don't like to deal in that because I think that is a, I think that's a little fickle for the industry. I believe that is a, it's a revenue tweak. It is not a wealth built tweak. And so I am taking the approach of number one, I am looking, if I'm looking at a new construction project, you have to understand the cash flows of that. So you probably won't start receiving revenues on a new build construction for around probably 12 to 14 months on average. So do you have the money to kind of go the distance there or is cash flow your game? So there's stuff that, that I'm buying at the beach right now. I'm cash flowing within 60 days. So that's about my criteria as long as I want to go before I'm starting to generate that cash and kind of building that piece out. So I am sticking with condos down there for right now because of my strategy. I like the fact that I can have a lot of built-in amenities. I can have control over a building. I can get a lot more things done and achieve those economies of scale when I have about five to seven units in a given block or a given building, and then I hop to another spot. And I think that I'm looking for what I consider tertiary markets. I am not going into the major cities and the blockbuster hits on places to invest on the forums. I'm going into, I mean, yeah, are are people talking about Panama City? A little bit, but not really, right? Are people talking about hot springs? I know that people have thrown it out there, but like who's got evidence to show from it, right? They talk about these people going here. We've got the evidence to show that we'll go in there, we will purchase these things, and we'll get them up and running, and they do well for us. But I'm not going to be going to the Smokies right now. I'm not going to be going to Orlando right now. I'm not going to be going to those larger areas there because it is just my investment strategy that's personal to me. Okay, so you buy the block, <laughs> so to yeah. speak. You you literally buy You take the buy the block strategy, which is good. Economies of scale and specifics areas. Also, yeah, if you con- are concerned about condo restrictions, which there are a lot of condos that either have restrictions or are going to have restrictions. But if they currently don't, and you become one fourth of the condo board, next thing you know, if they need 75% approval to get short term rental restrictions passed, well, they can't because John owns over 25% of the building. So well, it's, that- it's, 
It's interesting that you bring that up because that's exactly what was my, what my strategy was in 2016 when I started buying these condos in downtown Memphis. So I learned two things. Number one, I targeted HOAs that were all on the verge of bankruptcy. So I would look in their cash flows. I would see how they were like trending. And these were ones that were just kind of falling apart. Number two, I would go in there and immediately silently or publicly purchase up 25% of that board so that I could never be overtaken or I had, they had to have my approval in order to get bylaws passed. After that was done, I would have to, I would need more bodies. So I would bring in other investors that I was friends with because one person, even though he owns six, seven, eight condos can only hold one board seat. So we started to add friends, family, that kind of thing to the mix there. And at this point we control almost a 70% of the HOA. So we are the HOA. My so friends you are the kingpin. You are yeah. the kingpin. Your buildings. You yeah. took over buildings. <laughs> yeah. And so it was a very polarizing effect. I think I have a polarizing effect in general with people. Either people absolutely love me and they are diehard John Hodge, or they are just die John Hodge and they hate me. And, and you so, show up in the Lamborghini taking yeah, over and, the building. And that is like <laughs> that is salt in the wound for some people. And so I think that the same lady who told me during a board meeting that I could burn in hell came to me six months later and said, are you still interested in buying my condo? So ironic uh, how that it was <laughs> at that point for that HOA, all real estate roads led through John Hodge. That was just the reality of it. I had the money to do it. And with the HOA falling apart, we needed to kind of like wrangle and kind of put this stuff together. I'm happy to say at this point, we had on average around $10,000 in the bank during that time when I start, first started purchasing. We've now got an excess of over $175,000 in the bank for those HOAs, and we are flourishing right now. We have kept up better with building maintenance. It doesn't hurt that I own a construction company and I can get these things at cost. I know how to bid them out. I do a lot of the legwork there, so that's like my sacrifice into it. But yeah. the real benefit there is that our units look really good. They show really good, and people love to be there. Location is everything. You make it easy for them to get into the buildings. Yep. You put on the locks on the That's building right. versus right. like having to do some like, oh, keep a key and a padlock yep. around the corner. We and did that very early on. And that was a, we wanted ease of use, ease of use. You put these people down in one of the best locations that you can get in Memphis. There is walkable restaurants, bars, stores, all right there. It's hard to fuck up that investment. It really is. Got it. So at this point, but there's only so many buildings, like you could only, you, there's only so many buildings where that was even possible and you've yeah. identified them. And this is where I would say like real estate is not like, this is people talk about like, why is like wealth, like why do big corporations not take over everything and have those 17 units? Why does John Hodge from Memphis, Tennessee have them like real estate's not like an even playing field. Like you can identify things, you can have a strategy and you can execute on it. And if you do, you can kind of box people out. Yep. And now it's not a level playing field. And, but it's also like, even you had at that point, you had expertise, you had resources. I mean, it seems like when you started, like, again, you had that construction company, but you really didn't have that much. Like you didn't have the cash flow you have now or the bankability that you had now, but you just one by one made it yep. happen. You had a strategy and you executed on it over five years. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great point to say that don't make somebody else's strategy, your strategy, yeah. right? I know guys that I couldn't believe how they were buying these buildings and it was all through tax credits and taking these delinquent loans and purchasing through that. And to me, that, that was the most amazing piece of like, man, I never even thought about that strategy there, but I had to like take a step back and say, but that's just not my strategy. That's I didn't not what understand. You do. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I celebrate with those guys and I go and learn from them and I love just being around this ever evolving there is so much information out there. There's so many different ways to slice this thing. I do not believe that people actually have an excuse that want to really get into real estate, that they have an excuse not to be in it because I know people in all walks of life with all kinds of challenges that they get into real estate. They just do it. And so you don't have to take Jeremy's strategy. You don't have to take my strategy or anybody else's that you see. Because I will just say that some of the strategies that are out there on, on the Instagram and they're on the billboards and they're in the influence space, they're not real strategies, right? It's a cool story. Like people get hooked on the story, but like their bread and butter is somewhere else. And so 
understanding that like defining your strategy and what you can make your mark in, that's going to be a key piece. And I think for people to get into the game. Yeah. And your strategy, you can change. I think a lot of people think that like, oh, what I do today, like, I don't want to go down that route because they think it's going to like somehow pigeonhole them doing a thing like, oh, I don't want to start co-hosting other people's properties. <laughs> like that's like, like a job. Well, it's yeah. like, dude, you can start there. Like start there. Yep. Start, I started yeah. there. Like yeah renting properties that's right. you know, it doesn't mean you can't eventually buy a property it just means you're it's like a starting point so i think that's yeah. what's great about short-term rentals in particular is like there's really something for everyone you can be john hodge like buying out buying the block buying or you can be where john hodge was when he was 23 and you would have at that time i was cleaning you know, i was taking the cleaning fee i was taking the cleaning fee because i was cleaning the units and yeah. so like that was kind of like the little side hustle there that helped kind of build in a little bit more cash flow so that I could do the next investment. Exactly. So it's, it's, and it's great. I honestly, I think that's why short-term rentals in particular, I mean, and you do other, you do have other, like at this point, are you doing other types of real estate investments or are you purely short-term rental strategies? Yeah. So I am, I'm exiting the long-term rental space pretty much across my portfolio. You're selling um, your buildings. Yeah. And you know, I have to not be able to say a hundred, whatever doors anymore. <laughs> yeah, no. So listen, and that's the thing is like, I don't think it's going to ever bother me because it never impressed me before. Yeah. Um, fair enough. It was, it was always something that, that people were kind of in shock with. And I, and it, at the time I just didn't think about the number of doors and it, whether it being this, or whether it being that I know people with a lot more, like a lot more. Now, most of them say they got this many doors. And like, the reality is, it's like it's a percentage of a percentage yeah, yeah. of that. These were all done with my own cash. So that's why mine may be a little dwarfed. What, what, again, what, is, if you don't, what is the cash flow from your multifamilies relative? Like, is it just like at this point, <laughs> your short term rentals are just cash flowing so much more, even though there might, you might have less quote unquote doors, you are cash flowing yeah. significantly more with the short term than long term rentals. Yeah. So that $8 million, $8 million portfolio is really only generating around 425 to $450,000 in gross income there. Of and those, the eight, the 80, you said of the 72 units, 72 yep. units. So like yep. seven grand a piece per year or something. Yep. yep. So like and, they're and, at, they're like 600 buck a month apartments. Yep. Yep. They're, and again, it's like, it has been the biggest builder of equity for me, but it has like really sucked on cash flow. It hasn't done much. At yeah. All. And so when I look at my cash on equity return, Ryan Bakey and I are like, big drivers of people checking their cash on equity return. So I take my equity of what I've got left outside of my loan and I am looking at my cash flow after all my expenses there and pinning that as a percentage against my equity. Your equity. As if I can take that equity and redeploy, let's say that I've got like a four to five percent return and that's real life with four to five percent return on my equity. Do I think I'm going to take that equity? And go ahead and grab the gain, not pay taxes on it, 1031 into something else that I can make 12, 14, 18, 20% cash on cash return, then I opt to do that. But if you don't have a pulse on what your cash on equity return is, you'll sit there and you'll just be rich on paper. Your equity position, remember, it only matters at really three points. When you buy the asset, when you refi the asset or when you sell it. So all this thing of like, I got all this equity. It's like, well, did you refi? Well, no, but I know it's there. Well, the market's going to dictate where your equity is. And that's just a roller coaster. So I think that you've got to like understand that it only matters at those three points. No other time. Yeah. So you can say oh, I'm a millionaire on paper, but you're not really. And that's actually like something I'm personally dealing with is I start off with a lot of partnerships where the properties have went up a lot in value, uh, but it might just be more operational time relative to like what your cut is like mm -hmm. more. Whereas like, all right, you've, the properties have gone up so much in value that if you can take, you're already three X your initial investment, four X your initial investment. And then you can take that lever, that 20% up lever, even if you put 25% down, yep. lever it up and then like own the entire deal yourself that's the calculation. That's, it's a similar calculation, but it's sure. like, yeah, how do you take this equity? And that's the great thing about real estate is like, how do you take equity and then deploy that equity, lever that equity up in a calculated manner sure. in order to produce cash flow? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. So 
you are at this point, you're always calculating. And, and actually, I was, yeah, I was texting Ryan this morning. So bringing up Ryan, shout out. He was on the pod a few weeks back. So anyone wants to check that out. Okay. Great, a great episode on, on tax and st- stuff of that such. But so your current strategy is you're just always rejuggling. All right, I have this multifamily building. It's built up. I'm assuming probably at this point, you're making 400K a year, probably several million, right? I would assume in value. Yep. Yeah, our, our equity t- positions is probably four and a half, five million bucks. Got it. Okay. We only, we only have $3 million in debt on it. Okay. So you can take a couple million dollars out. But for you, I'm assuming what will make you pull the trigger is like when you know where you're going to deploy that $2 million because you have to do it within, to do a 1031 exchange, you have to do it within a certain time period. So I'm assuming that's kind of your hold up there or correct me if I'm wrong. So, so we are active, we have been actively looking and finding deals, but it's the timing aspect that is going to be challenging kind of like on the deployment of it. So I think that I've got to constantly be in the market. I have to constantly plug with brokers. They have to know what my buy box is. I have to act extremely quickly because the 45 days, they just fly by. And I, when I find the deal that is the deal, I pull the trigger immediately. So I don't want to hesitate and say like, well, I've got a few more days to do this. Like the market moves on great Mm -hmm. deals. And so being ready to go on that is, is really like kind of what the focus is. We may take a little bit of money home. I may go ahead and take the large portion of it, largest portion of it. And I will be deploying that into short-term rentals strictly from a aspect of like, okay, let's say that I, let's say that I can't get to what my, my, my 20% gross ROI, which is my typical, at least minimum buy box. Let's say I can't get there, right? Let's say that I can get to even a 10 or 12% gross ROI. If I'm going to be taking an $8 million asset there in the same $8 million asset that I have today, it most generates what, $450,000, $475,000 in gross income. And I can take that and even just get to a million bucks. That's the calculation. That's the calculation. So it's like, then I get my cash flow back. My debt portion can stay the same. My equity can stay the same. But all I'm doing is adding just more money to the bottom line there in cash flow for myself for partners that I'm aligned with. Cash flow is a big number for us. The appreciation comes in a not too distant second, but it is second. Got it. So okay. So right now you're on the hunt. You are on the hunt. You are looking to re 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 I'll say rejigger. I don't know if that's the word, but I'm gonna redeploy. Kind of redeploy. Yeah. Rede- redeploy. And really you're looking for a very big deal, even for your standards on eight eight million dollar purchase. So okay, well keep me posted. I'm I'm excited to see you this effective deployment. <laughs> and for those listening, what's like one, like, what is your pro tip? Like, what is a tangible piece of advice you can share with those, those listening? So get yourself around the most successful people that will give you access to them. And I have been able to do a lot in this space by getting around the people that are doing great things. And I am at the conferences. I am at meetings. I am going to getting involved with it because Not only does it need to be on the, from the educational purposes, do I gain a lot there, but I need to be on the forefront of people that are moving and making moves in the space. And so surround yourself with people, however you have to do it, whether you have to pay for it, whether you have to sneak in the back door or whatever you have to do to get around the crowds, get around the crowds. So put yourself in front of like-minded folk who are growing in the right direction or yep. are already in the direction you want to be. Sure. There is last one last thing that I want to go ahead and plug here. My Instagram handle is right here. John, J-O-N, Hodge, H-O-D-G-E-1 on Instagram. Connect with me there. I am, Jeremy, we talked a little bit beforehand in regards to some AI software that I am working on in regards to performance. And I am busily building that out to get access to that in the future there. We will get to give access to those that sign up on my website, which is John, J-O-N, Hodge, H-O-D-G-E dot com for first access on that. And it's going to be an awesome tool. We talked just a little bit about it, and I think it's going to really change our industry as far as how we look at performance. Yeah. And one thing I do, I want to share when I met John, I showed him our pro forma software and he, I had never, and gave him an example property. And I've never had someone just in such a quick period of time look at it and point out, this looks off here, or this this line item, or this op- opex was the thing in particular he pointed out is off. So, 
John is great at just, I mean, you've, I mean, you probably looked at tens of thousands of pro formas at this point <laughs> in your day. Sure. So definitely, Absolutely. definitely check John out on social media and follow him. And also, I mean, I don't know if you're willing to people to reach out to you to help with their pro formas. You, you'll never know till you shoot your shot. Right? <laughs> so impress me with something. Give me something of value there. Tell me you're going to go mentor somebody there. I am really big on people giving back and people paying it forward. So who knows? Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, John. Really appreciate it. All righty, guys. Until next time. Thanks for coming.